So, Curtis. Salicardo. We are in it. Committed. There's no turning back now. We do this for the next 114 weeks, and I'm here for it. I think we're at 113 now. That okay, I'll be, I'll be off by one, apparently, the entire run. <laughs> Was there 114 episodes or 115? I've got it wrong every single time. This is 114 total. So Okay, so this is 113. Yeah. So okay, this lucky is 113. Season 1, Episode 2 of Blossom. It's called My Sister's Keeper. Now... Yeah, okay. But counting down, this would be the... Okay, Episode 2. <laughs> I'm making this way harder than it needs to be. Yeah, let's just count up. So we're on Episode 2. Now, the, the way that we watch this show here in Canada is on Disney+. Plus. So we're not affiliated with them in any way, but we'll gladly take their money if they want to throw it at us. Yeah. I do have to say that... The descriptions for the episodes on Disney Plus suck. And let me give you a comparison. Okay. So the description for this episode on Disney Plus goes as such. Joey makes Blossom nervous about her prom date. Ah. And I don't even think that's accurate at all. No. All right. So from now on, for the rest of this podcast, I'm going to be using the TV database because it's a much more accurate description. Maybe you should compare them each week. Yeah, is that a good idea, or is that boring? I love it. All right. Here's what we think the fans in Canada will get excited about. Here's what the biggest company in the world couldn't hire good enough interns to do. So the TV database's summary goes like this. Blossom looks forward to her first prom date with Joey's friend Bobby. But after Joey warns Nick about Bobby's reputation as a ladies' man, he forbids Blossom to go out with him. Yeah, that's that. That's a little more colored. Yeah, I, I feel like that's in way more accurate. Got up in Canada. Yeah, we're getting screwed over here by Disney Plus. In Canada, Disney's like you folks are just watching The Little Mermaid on repeat. Nobody's cares about Blossom or is reading <laughs> this. They totally gave it to some intern. You're right. Yeah, yeah, that's who exactly hates what Blossom. happened. Somebody who's getting punished had to do the episodic description of all 114 episodes of Blossom, yeah. and. He or she was already burnt out by episode two, which is also fun to think about. Blossom overcomes an obstacle. Blossom gets some inf- receives some information that's not what it seems. A misunderstanding leads to chaos in the Russo house. <laughs> I hope Blossom overcomes an obstacle is the description for at least one episode that we review. It's not far off. What was what was this week's again? Joey makes Blossom nervous about her prom date. Okay, Sal. Yeah, let's get into this episode, man. I just want to say, first of all, in watching this episode and taking my notes, I went down quite a few rabbit holes along the way. So I hope you'll indulge me this week because... Uh, I love you for that. <laughs> I, I feel like we've got some good stuff to talk about, but I'll, I'll get into it as we go along. I only went down one rabbit hole and it wasn't even a rabbit hole because I, I was ready for this. Awesome. Okay, so starting off again... Right after the intro of the show, we go to the establishing shot outside the house with, like, the music playing. And again, I'm just laughing. And I think I realize why I'm laughing, like, why that makes me laugh every time, is because of two things. I'll direct you to YouTube for both of them. The first one being, have you ever seen Adult Swim's uh, Too Many Cooks? Only about a thousand times. (laughs) It's just, like, a 12-minute parody of, like, every 90s tv show intro ever but there's also an snl skit that kyle mooney and beck bennett do where they parody 90s sitcoms in about three minutes so that's where my mind goes whenever i see the opening establishing shot it just cracks me up every time and we're not even into the episode yet and you're already laughing that's a that's a testament (laughs) to our journey okay we are in blossom's bedroom Blossom and Six are dancing to a ghetto blaster, which gives me all sorts of warm feelings. Right. I love this scene for the main reason that you can tell Mayim, 
is a gal who cannot dance. So she's pretending she can't dance very well, and she really can't dance very well. Jennifer Von Oy, on the other hand, you could tell dances like a queen. And she is pretending she can't dance, because that's the whole thing of this scene, is that Six and Blossom are practicing dancing, and neither are very good. But if you know anything about dancing, you can tell Blossom really doesn't know, and Jenna Von Oy is trying to pretend she doesn't know. And I soaked up every second of that laughing. Because you just know. I bet you Jenna Von Oy could just have done like a 22-minute routine. It could have been the whole episode. Well, is that just because you're biased towards uh, Jenna Von Oy, or is that... No, you-, you could tell. You could tell. The girl had, had rhythm, and she was trying to like... Yeah, fair enough. I, it. I couldn't tell at all because I don't know anything about dance. I'm a horrible dancer. Well, so am I, but I've uh, I've got a child who dances quite professionally, so I notice these things. Right. No, that's fair. And I'm saying, and I was just gonna say, like, if and when we actually recreate the intro where we do like the blossom and six coordinated dance, like I will totally be the blossom in that situation. Mm, it'll be a couple blossoms. I will superimpose my head over my son's body. That sounds really creepy, but he's the dancer in the family. Well, deep fake is pretty good these days. If you've seen any of that yeah. online, you could just deep fake your face. Over and top. his favorite line is, just because you dance, don't make you a dancer. And it's good. <laughs> it's good wow. advice. Wow, fair enough. Yeah. yeah, so while they're dancing, they end up stumbling over one another. And uh, is it six? Yeah, it's six. She uh, kind of trips into the window of Blossom's bedroom. And at that point, she sees Joey walking into their house with who she calls the guy, Bobby Brewer. Welcome, Bobby Brewer. Do we want to talk about the actor who played Bobby Brewer? Do you want to go down that rabbit hole before I do? Uh, yeah, I do. And maybe maybe this is the same deep dive that we have because I feel like this is right up your alley. He was played by Stephen Dorff. This is so up my alley. Stephen Dorff. Yes, and who is still acting today, and like his probably probably his most notable role today would be uh, Detective Roland West in True Detective season three. But I think I know where you're going to talk about him from. All right, gather gather round, children. Let me All tell right. you about a time before LimeWire. I when the, when the nineties began. I was not a teenager. When the 90s ended, I was not a teenager. So yes, I was the luckiest person alive to have lived those teenage years through the greatest decade known to man. Steven right. Dorff was, and this is crazy to see because this is 1991. He looks like a child. Yeah. Two years later, he is in one of the greatest music videos ever made. One I knew that it. I watched so many times. I knew it. As a kid... I, I didn't even realize how much this video penetrated my young brain and cha- changed me as a human being until I watched it again probably five years ago for the first time in like 20 years, maybe 15 years. So Aerosmith made a little video for the song called Cryin', which yep. was one of their biggest hits. Yep. And it was not only Alicia Silverstone's first break... She played opposite Steven Dorff, who was the jerk boyfriend. Yes. I knew it. So, I knew it. That's exactly where you were going. Before I come back to these two, did you ever watch ABC's Lost? Uh, no. Okay. Well, one of the main characters, Sawyer, is also in this music video, which I had no idea until, again, I saw it for the first time five years ago. That for the, you know, for after 20 years or whatever. So, that's neither here nor there. So is, that, is, that Dorf, Matthew, is that Matthew Fox who played Sawyer? No, it's, I don't know, the other guy. He, he steals her backpack during the harmonica solo, and then she drop kicks him and yells a swear word, which you could see because you can read her lips, but obviously they don't have that come across <laughs> yeah. in I remember, audio form. However, as a kid, that was like the coolest thing ever. This video was the coolest thing ever. So. It was. I, no, I this, remember the video. So you have Alicia Silverstone, who is just, you know, Amaz- would become an amazing actress at the time. She was just amazing to look at in my young my young uh, life. Then Steven Dorff, at the time, I thought was the coolest person in the world. He's walking around in, like, jeans and a black shirt, which I think is where I got my look I still have to this day. Also, 
Uh, I don't want to go too far into it because that's not what this podcast is about. But what do you? Of course, it is. I wrote a book that was picked up by a publisher, and going back and watching this video, I swear to God, I subliminally wrote my main character after the Alicia Silverstone's character in this video. Like it checks all the boxes. Really? Yeah. Because she's kind of like the victim at the beginning, and by the end, she's just kind of nuts. And I, it was like going to therapy watching this video. But anyway, Steven Dorf is the boyfriend, and it starts where he's cheating on her, and then she kind of busts him and then kicks him out of the car. Yeah. And then yeah. it builds to a climax where she's... This is so 1993. You would, not, you would not see this in a music video today, not that you see music videos. She is standing on a bridge like she's about to commit suicide, and there's all these police cars and there's policemen, and then I guess they get a hold of the boyfriend. So Stephen Dorff shows up and walks up to Alicia Silverstone standing on the bridge about to commit suicide, and he's still kind of a jerk. <laughs> he does this like, just get off the, like, just come here. You know, he's not sweating this at all. Yeah. And there's just so much going on in this video that warped my young mind, probably for the worse, but I love Stephen Dorff. It's a classic music Talking video. a few years later, the whole 90s, I know I'm a few years older than you, 90s were counterculture. It was cool not to care in a different way than it is today. Yeah. Today is kind of like removed. You're not supposed to feel ups or downs. In the 90s, you were supposed to feel angst and raging against the machine 24-7. Right. And Steven Dorff was the main character in a little unknown movie called SFW. Okay. Which is the most 90s movie you will ever find because it wasn't even a mainstream movie. So we're talking an underground movie starring Steven Dorff as the main character. And that is exactly where you wanted to be in the 90s. was talking about this movie and seeing this movie because it was just underground and amazing and was everything the 90s encompassed. And that's my Steven Dorff story. Then he went away for a little while and he reappeared in my favorite Britney Spears song video. If it's cool to have a favorite Britney Spears song. Sure 2003's Every Time. I don't know if he was dating her at the time. I didn't really look that up. It's a really sad, slow piano ballad by Britney. And the video is them storming through backstage at some arena having a fight. And he's throwing flowers. And I just love Steven Dorff. That's my Steven Dorff story. I don't know any other acting role he has outside of those three. I know he's done a whole bunch of things. Like you said, I've not seen season three of uh the show you mentioned true detective true detective yeah i saw the first two seasons i have not seen the steven dorf season somehow but i shall now there are we out of time that's me professing my love for all that was steven dorf from 1991 to 2003 or 1993 that was a decade 93 to 2003 love the man and here he is in blossom that's great man i had no idea I mean, I, fan. I mean, once I looked up the the crying video, I knew that that's what you were gonna you were gonna hone in oh, on. Oh yeah, but, but that's amazing. Jeans and a black t shirt and pretends he doesn't care about anything. Come on, who does that describe? It's actually kind of interesting how, like, you described him in the crying video, how he was like the jerk boyfriend. Because this whole episode of Blossom, that's where I thought it was going, and I was very surprised that it didn't go that way. It is an odd script, my friend, an odd script. So the first time I watched the episode was on my work break. And uh, I had to go back to work when there was like three minutes left in the show. And then I put it off for two days before I finished the rest of the episode. So for two days, I was rolling it around in my head that I was expecting him to play the jerk and where the episode was going to go. And uh, it doesn't go there. You're expecting that other shoe to, to drop, and it never does, and it's weird. I was waiting for the other shoe to drop the whole time, and then it didn't. So, in the next scene... First of all, they say, quote, let's go look at him, which is a funny line, but before they do, they have to stop and check their hair in the mirror. There's a few things that I could address in this episode that I, I feel like if the roles were reversed, it would not be okay at all. Such as? Well, that being like, let's go look at him. Yeah. Talking about a, a boy coming into their house being like, oh, let's go get a look at him. I feel like if the roles were reversed, he'd be like, ah, that's not okay. You know? Yeah. That's one of two things that really stood out to me. In Would that. it be okay by today's standards if it was the same genders and the girls were like, let's go downstairs and gawk at him? Would that be 
okay? I feel That's like question. I feel like people probably wouldn't bring it up whereas if it was reversed today or even in 1991 it would be like oh that's weird that's odd like they're gonna go gawk at these girls that's creepy like you know yeah that's that's fair we'll call it even from episode one where they make the joke that blossoms officially become a woman because they've all been waiting for her for 15 minutes downstairs while she gets ready yeah we'll, we'll call that even we're all one right. for one all right fair we're enough. one for one on kind of the cringy gender jokes for blossom all right if we're keeping score then yeah that's good so the next scene cuts downstairs in the living room, and I just want to say right off the bat, uh, in this episode, Nick Russo, like the father, I think he's becoming my favorite character on the show. Yeah. He has a lot of laugh out loud moments for me. So in this scene, uh, I wrote down he's playing Muzak on his piano. <laughs> I, okay. I, what he was playing, I don't think qualified as real music. <laughs> Fair enough. So he's playing it for Joey and his friend Bobby, and uh, he's he's talking about how he's stressed because he's got a big event coming up called the Hollywood Bowl, to which Joey makes a reference about how many lanes do they have there? And he says, no, it's a benefit concert. Classic Joey. And what really surprised me about this was that I assumed that Nick, the father, was like this down-on-his-luck musician but he rattles off a few big names in music that I wasn't expecting that he's going to be working with. So he was saying that the Muzak song that he was playing on the keyboard for Joey would sound a lot better because Ella Fitzgerald was supposed to do the vocals, but she backed out. Then he went on to say that the benefit is going to have Tony Bennett, Mel Torme, and Stephen Eady, to which Joey responds with, some benefit, they're not going to make any money unless we get some names. <laughs> And I'm wondering who they think the audience for Blossom is at this moment. Is that a joke teenage girls are going to, like, slap their knees at? I don't know. Maybe. So now we know kind of the B-plot for the episode is that Nick is got a lot on his mind because he's getting ready to work this benefit, which sounds like kind of mm -hmm. a big deal. Sounds like there's a lot of big musicians there. Yep. They go into the kitchen. And to show us that Bobby Brewster is a stud, he turns his chair around and straddles it to sit down, which is something the world is lacking in 2021, and I am bringing it back as of now. Next time you see me, I am going to turn my chair around and straddle it when I sit down. 100%. The first time I watched it on my first watch through, I noticed that, and I forgot to write it down the second time. Was that a 90s thing? I feel like that was, like, an Uncle Jesse, like, cool thing. Like, you sat backwards on the it's chair. It's a Steven Dorf cool thing, my friend. Uh, he just extended his cool run from 1993 to 2003 down to 1991 to 2003. I can't get enough of the Dorf. You love the Dorf. I love the Dorf. <laughs> I need more 90s Dorf. You're like a, uh, a Dorfanite. A Dorfian? A dor you're a Dorf dork. <laughs> I'll take it. It's his only episode, so we better come up with something quick. I just want to show up at, like, a possible crime scene and be like, Girlfriend, I got pizza pops in the microwave. Like, let's go. <laughs> I want to be, like, that level of disingenuine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Bobby says he thought about being a musician once. Then he quotes the Dire Straits song. Money for nothing and chicks for free. Yes. And I'm happy he just didn't he didn't keep going and do the next line because much like last week when we had uh, Claire Huxtable, which made us sad reminding how much controversy and horrible stuff we would later learn Bill Cosby did, forever tainting the Cosby show, the song Money for Nothing and Chicks for Free has been removed from most radio stations by now because... They use the offensive gay slang word that starts with an F three times in five lines in the second verse of that song. Yes. And that was where my mind went. I was like, oh, let's not talk about that song, Blossom. I think something else we should keep track of is see if there's something in every episode that has now been canceled. Well, so far we have The Cosby Show and Bobby Brown from episode one. Yeah. And now we have Dire Straits from episode two. Yeah, we should keep a, keep, keep a running tally of this. That's three in two episodes. Joey says, why does he need more chicks? 
he could give all his girls tubas and they and he'd have a parade. <laughs> I don't think I said that right. But he basically said if he gave all the girls that were after Bobby tubas, he'd have a parade. And I love that line cuz it's so stupid, but it's so fitting with Joey cuz right. he probably thought that was clever. Yeah. And I really I really enjoyed that that they wrote to the character so well. It wasn't something actually clever and funny. It was stupid, which is what made it funny. They really cranked up the Joey being an airhead in episode two here. As we will talk about later, I feel like the pilot went to the network and they forced some changes immediately before episode two went into production. Yeah. There are some hard left turns script wise in episode two compared to the stage that was set in episode one. We'll get to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now Six and Blossom walk into the kitchen, and Blossom really quickly figures out Joey's batting average. And Bobby says, quote, You figured that out and talked at the same time? End quote. And I cry for women. What was that, Bobby? Yeah. What an offensive line. (laughs) So we learn in this, through this scene, that Bobby is getting ready to go to prep school in Arizona because he's going to have a baseball scholarship. Yep. And Joey seems to be honed in on all the girls that he's going to meet while he's in Arizona. And Blossom kind of sympathizes with Bobby here, where she says to him, it must be pretty sad that you're going to be leaving all your family and friends to go away to Arizona. Like, that's got to be pretty scary for you. And right away... Yes. This episode went in another direction that I thought it was going to because Bobby instantly seems really into her. And again, from the way that Joey was talking about him, I thought this episode was going to go in a completely different direction here. Absolutely. A couple things before let me get caught up here. Okay. Joey keeps saying they have to go study because of this scholarship. Yes. And if there's one thing I've learned about Joey in an episode and a quarter, it's that he is the study help you want, right? Oh, yeah. Like, the guy's an idiot. Yeah. So, I kind of scratched my head at that, why Bobby Brewer is coming over to study with Joey, who's an idiot. Yeah. But we'll get past that. Joey, at one point, tells Blossom she's being stupid, and the audience laughs at that. (laughs) I noticed that as well. so far is my favorite inappropriate audience laugh track moment. He goes, Blossom, you're being stupid. And then, ha, 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 ha. I was like, no. Yeah, that was poor placement. No. Joey has the line where after Blossom says, it's probably going to be lonely going to Arizona. Joey's like, there's so many babes there. If you want to not be lonely, you go eeny, meeny, miny, yo. (laughs) Yeah. To which Blossom responds, makes you proud to be a woman. Just taking a beating this episode. Yeah, that was the only other thing that I really have about this scene was that Bobby seemed way too into Blossom. Absolutely. And then when he finally leaves, Six claims he looked at Blossom in a way that if he had looked at her like that, Six would have been on him like, quote, a coat of paint. (laughs) I thought that was pretty sexual for Blossom, which I have questions about the Six character now. Is she the Bobby Brewer of women? I don't know. Could be. It was uh, It was an odd quote, you know? Yeah, it was. The only thing that I had about Six in this scene was her hat. <laughs> we have yet to see a classic Blossom hat, but what was up with Six's hat in this scene? It was bright pink with a purple shiny bow. Six is an odd character. She I'm really sure is. There's information out there that has the background to the transformation of the character six first of all the name six yeah and then why she started out with the odd iconic look that blossom would eventually absorb and make famous kind of like how anthony said whoa in episode one Mm. which would obviously become joey's catchphrase all questions will be answered sal the journey continues so bobby just straight up walks into blossom's room when she has the door closed yeah he does Blossom's practicing the trumpet. All of a sudden, she pretends like she's not down with the trumpet because she wants to seem cool for Bobby. And again, Bobby seemed way overly into Blossom in this scene and was 
interested in her playing the trumpet and said he noticed her in the school band. And he calls her unusual. Yeah. Which is a terrible pickup line. Yeah, that's not great. But Blossom's into it either way. Before that, though, he admits to Blossom that he is scared about going away to school, which is, I guess, he was glad that Blossom picked up on that. But he says that while he's gone, he's going to miss Blossom. How long have you known Blossom? From the kitchen to walking into her room? You're going to miss this girl? I thought it was weird. This is moving incredibly fast for a 22-minute sitcom. Yeah, I thought so too. I thought the pacing was very odd in this. You watch the scene and you get that, like, darkness is seeping into this, right? You get that feeling? Yeah, that's exactly what I felt the whole time. Absolutely. There's no way this is happening for real in this way. Yeah. This is this is going to end poorly, and that is going to be the lesson of this episode. That's exactly what I was thinking the entire time. It's almost distracting how into her he is. Yeah, I, I felt exactly that way. You're looking for clues where he's lying to her and putting this act on. He's going to be the jerk. Yeah. Before Bobby leaves the room, he says that he wants to call Blossom sometime. And I thought that was a very 90s thing, to schedule a phone call. You just, what do you do, you swipe left these days? Yeah, like it's, you know, like it's just, it's, I'm going to call you sometime. Okay, when are you free? Like they had to schedule a phone call. Yeah, I lived through that. If he was really into her, he'd make her a mixtape. And that doesn't happen in this episode, unfortunately. No, we skipped way past that. They are like suddenly on date six. Yeah, it progressed very quickly in the span of, from the kitchen to studying upstairs with Joey. As <laughs> as Bobby it leaves... rest the... amazingly quick from the kitchen to her bedroom, is what you're trying to say. <laughs> I didn't want to say it that way, but... Uh... Blossom, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes. Blossom. As Bobby leaves the room and closes the door, she plays the... Da, 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 charge on the trumpet, like, as if he would not have heard that. And you can immediately tell why he's totally into her, right? He, oh, man. Absolutely. <laughs> The next scene, I don't know if this is like a week later or when this happens. She's talking on the phone and it's apparently the 16th call. I think it was just over the weekend. I think they mentioned she said he called her 16 times or they talked on the phone 16 times that weekend. And even six is skeptical, which was like another, I thought, little bit of foreshadowing from how this is going to end so badly for Blossom. Cause six... They were playing it up like he was the known, like, ladies' man. And it was like he, like, uses yeah. girls. And, like... and Six has a moment of jealousy where she's kind of questioning, like, why does he want you, Blossom? No offense. Yeah, absolutely. Which was fair. And, I, again, I thought foreshadowing of he's taken this girl for a ride and he's got something sinister planned as the payoff. It never happens. No. So Blossom has this moment where she says, he likes me. He really likes me. To which Six responds with, you sound like Sally Field. Now, this is the rabbit hole that I went on. And it, it went pretty, it went a lot further than I was expecting it to. Because the line, like, you like me, you really like me. Like, I know that's affiliated with Sally Field, but I never knew why. I don't know either. Was it an Oscar speech? Yes. Now, it gets okay, crazy. Sorry, sorry to sorry to blow that for no, you. No, absolutely ahead. not. No, you're right. But it gets crazier than that. Sally Field won the Oscar in 1980 for her role in Norma Ray. And up until that point, she was seen as like a TV comedy actress. She was the flying nun, whatever. So like it wasn't expected that she was going to be taken seriously or win the Oscar. So she ended up winning. And then after she won the Oscar in 1980 for Norma Ray, it was kind of like, oh, it was the TV comedian who happened to win an Oscar. She won the Oscar for Best Actress again in 1985 for a movie called Place in the Heart. And during her acceptance speech, she felt like the Academy had finally accepted her. And she ended her speech with, and I can't deny the fact that you like me. Right now, you like me. And that often got quoted as you like me you really like me and that's wow. normally where this would end however curtis it goes deeper than that are you aware of something called the mandela effect i sure am yes so there is a mandela effect theory about this speech no way 
I only know about the Berenstein Bears one. There's a lot of Mandela effects out there, and I didn't know and that the Monopoly this... Man one. Yeah, with the monocle, yep. and yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is another one of those theories. And the theory is that people swear she actually said, you like me, you really like me, which is verbatim what Blossom says in this episode. Yeah. But in her speech, she didn't say that. So the theory is people also remember her name being Sally Fields and not Sally Field. So they think that where she said, you like me, you really like me, was Sally Fields saying that in an alternate universe, whereas in our universe, Sally Field said, you like me. Okay, it's not Sally Fields? No, there's no S on the end of it. It's Sally Fields. <sighs> Wow. I told you, Curtis. Okay. Rabbit hole, man. Rabbit hole. That, well done, my friend. <laughs> no, it, that's good stuff. It just it just kept unraveling. Let's keep this going. So, All right. Six says, he's the kind of boy you give Michelle Pfeiffer to for Christmas. Talking about Bobby. Yeah. That, let's not dig too deep into that. Because no. that has a little bit of a darkness to it as well. A little bit. There's some vague sexual jokes in this, which I thought I'd enjoy a lot more, but they didn't really land with me. No, I'm with you there. <laughs> six six Wh- saying she'd be on him like a coat of paint. Eh. Looking at anyway. this looking at this through like the lens of twenty twenty one really changes yeah. the perspective of a lot oh, of Oh for sure. But that's why we're this. doing this. Exactly. So Blossom says when she thinks about him. She sees little sparkly things. Joey walks in and says, Oh, I was kicked there once too, which is a really funny line. And that was the exact moment I realized that would be a line from Joey from Friends. And is that where Joey from Friends got the inspiration was from this Joey? Ah, Has anybody ever tried to connect that? Because it's a very similar character. He's just like an older version of Joey, that Joey. Yeah, you're right. Right? Yeah. Completely. Just something about the way he walked in and delivered that line in an just oblivious dumb guy. It was very delivery. it was very Joey Tribbiani. Very Joey Tribbiani. Wow. Right? Yeah, no, yeah. definitely. So it's at this point that uh Joey says he thinks that Bobby's a real dog. He's not sure what Bobby really wants to do with Blossom. He was kind of shocked that, that Bobby even wants to hang out with her. Yeah. So Bobby arrives at the house and says, "Ah, yeah, actually, I'm here for Blossom. We're uh, going to go for a walk or a soda or something. Our options were limited dating in 1991. I guess so. They go for a walk. Yes. And this is kind of the second time they've alluded to Six having a crush on Blossom's brother, Joey. That's who she was excited to see out the window at the beginning of the episode, right? It wasn't Bobby. It was Joey. Yeah, I noticed that so too. So then Blossom and Bobby leave on their walk. And she kind of swoons over Joey and says, well, do you want to go for a walk with me? And Joey goes, yeah, sure. Start without me. And she gets excited and leaves the house. (laughs) And he turns around and goes, like, back into the living room. Which, again, not cool. (laughs) It was played for laughs, but total jerk move. Yeah. The characters are becoming very inconsistent, which is an ongoing theme of this episode, which is where we go next. Joey talks to his dad about Bobby. Now, Bobby is someone who basically scores with every girl he goes out with. That's said aloud. It's not even vaguely... What's the word I'm looking for? It's not alluded to. Thank you. It's not alluded to. So, dad's obviously not excited about that. No. He says, oh, you're talking about Bobby the dead boy. Yeah. Also funny. So, Blossom returns home and she's dancing and pirouetting and spinning. Because Bobby asked her to the junior prom. Yeah. Joey has a really good moment because he starts out dumb, but it turns into a good moment because he's worried about his sister. Yeah. And he doesn't want his best friend to just, like, you know, seduce his sister, which shows he's actually a pretty good guy. Yeah. And he's really driving it home and he says, Bobby home run is taking Blossom the rookie to the junior prom. Yeah. He basically doesn't want his friend to deflower his sister and have Blossom just be, like, another number, which is good. It's a good moment for him, you know? It's it, it keeps it in the Joey character, but it also manages to give him a little more depth where he's not just the dumb guy. He actually is a good guy, worried about his sister, and for some strange reason, he's dressed like Aladdin. <laughs> what? 
<laughs> go look. He's wearing like a, a crazy, crazy purple and gold short sleeved shirt that looks like the carpet and then he's wearing a gold sleeveless vest over top <laughs> if the song arabian nights was a wardrobe it would be that <laughs> that i didn't pick up on what i did pick up on in this scene was that i noticed that nick had an earring he had like a sparkly earring in his left ear in this scene and i thought oh they're like he's not musician enough we gotta make him look more musician what does he need he needs one sparkly earring in his left ear and honestly you're making that as a joke but you're probably not wrong <laughs> i really feel like the channel or the studio or whatever stepped in after seeing the pilot yeah. and gave them a list of demands to almost dumb the show down compared to the pilot all the praise that we had for episode one being like this thing's outside the box this is so like ahead of its time this is so it's gone it's been scrubbed so nick walks into blossom's room there's another big name drop that he was working with liza minnelli on this benefit did you go down this rabbit hole no i did not i kind of did and then i gave up because the line is and it's clearly a shot or it means something where the problem is there's 15 acts, 14 of them want to end with the song New York, New York. Yeah. All of them, Beliza Minnelli. And that obviously meant something. So I Googled it and she was in a movie in the 70s called New York, New York. Okay. So was the joke, she's the only one that probably should end her set with New York, New York, and she's the only one that didn't want and to? And she doesn't that? want to do it? Yeah, that makes sense. Was that the joke? Okay. This was the scene where I literally leaned back in my chair and said, what is happening with this show from last week to this week? Yeah. He's no longer acting like he has a great father-daughter open dialogue, and he's just putting his foot down. He's not trusting her, and he's saying, this is the way it's going to be, which is a completely different parenting strategy than he had in the first episode right i was really scratching my head at this i feel like episode one dad could have sat down and been blossom i trust you here's where we're at bobby has a history of expecting sex from all of his dates just so you know i have every reason to believe taking you to junior prom is going to end with him expecting to sleep with you yeah. I feel like they could have easily had that conversation and he could have approached it that way, giving her a heads up and even saying, you're probably not ready for this. So ball's kind of in your court. Like you have to really roll your head around that this is what he's probably going to be expecting at the end of the night. And you're 14. So, you know, not telling you not to do it, but you're probably in over your head at this point going to the prom with Bobby, who has this track record of sleeping with everyone. And instead, he was like, this is the way it is. You can't go. Isn't that kind of his role in the show? Because, like, even in the first episode, he kind of right away went to, like, well, maybe she's on drugs. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's that. So I feel like from the scene prior, when Joey kind of, like, built it up as, like, it's well known that he's the lady killer, that he would, I feel like that's kind of par for the course. Like, he would just freak out. Because it kind of gets explained later when uh, Anthony finally comes into the episode and talks about it. Is that like Nick knows how to deal with, you know, his sons, which is way more loosely than it is having a young daughter. It's a really good take. That's a really good take, Sal. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's my take on, on how the scene went. But he did come in and kind of say those things to her. But it came in, it, you're right. Like, it, it didn't come in a sense of like, all right, well, the ball's in your court. It came of like, I'm forbidding you to do this. And that's because this guy is known to be like this. I guess you're right, though. Joey did get him riled up. Yeah. But I feel like he would have at least given her the chance to come to that conclusion herself, which he didn't. He was like, there's no way this is going to happen. But maybe... Maybe he was under the impression that she wasn't against that. I don't know. Yeah. You you changed my you changed my mind a little bit. Okay, fair enough. And I yeah. and and Blossom's whole point of view on this argument is that you know, she's old enough to be aware of the implications. 
<laughs> to reference another show, yes. <laughs> but she is, you know, old enough and smart enough to to be aware of that and that her dad should trust her, which is kind of her point. Fair. But it doesn't go over that well in this scene. She runs next door as usual or wherever this Agnes lives. Is it her neighbor? Yes, Mrs. Swanson. And I'm glad that yep. she was back in this episode. So as I do deep dives on, you know, uh, guest characters, uh, I did yep. one on Agnes last week. And uh, she's played by actress named Eileen Brennan, who passed away in 2013. Um, now, she, ah. she had a long TV career. But I only want to reference things that I care about on this show. So was she in anything with Stephen Dorff? Uh, yeah, this episode of Blossom. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the only thing that really stood out to me that I care about the most was that she played Mrs. Peacock in the movie Clue. No way. Yeah, you think that she's going to be a major character that uh, Blossom's going to go to for things? She's their Wilson. Yeah. Spoiler alert: she gets scrapped after the third episode. No, we only have one more episode of Agnes. Yeah, but I think Agnes wow. is a really good character because I think that she kind of does act as like the the like motherly character that Blossom needs where Blossom goes to her to vent and she kind of gives Blossom the advice to go back to her dad and have the conversations that they can work out whatever tension is between them. That's too bad. I would love to see the slow reveal how Agnes just had a had a hard life that's why she's so wise like she's only like 32 yeah she's at agnes's house agnes kind of again sympathizes with her dad like she she kind of plays this role really well of seeing things from both ways and blossom's still upset and agnes says to her you know like if you're really that sure and really that passionate about this then you should go and take your stand with your dad like go back and talk to him and and tell him how you really feel about it but not before she asks about Bobby and goes through a checklist of all the male undesirable traits. And Short. Short is on the list. <laughs> and I throw my laptop across the room because nothing has changed. In all the advancements of social acceptability, you can still make fun of short people. Short guys are still deemed unattractive. And I'm waiting for that to be an immediate public shame if you make fun of short people, but I don't know if we're ever going to get there, Sal. We have a lot of learning and growing to do as society before being a short man is on the list of things you cannot joke about. But I wait for that day. I wait for that day on pins and needles. The way that things are going, I don't think it's too far off, Curtis. I'm here for it. This was the other, um, from earlier, the other thing that I picked up on in this episode, that if it was a reverse roles thing, it would be kind of creepy. And it's like, I don't know if this is funny today still or not. But this obviously got laughs in 91 where Blossom's describing Bobby to Agnes and talking about all of his good traits and how he's tall and handsome and smart and whatever. And then Agnes replies with, uh, is he into older women? Yeah, you could. I'll give you that one. You could not do that joke the other way. No. Not even in 1991. Not at all. No, not at all. Yeah, that is a definite red light. Yeah. So that's where uh, Blossom and Agnes end in this episode is Agnes says, well, if you really feel that passionate about this, then you should really take a stand and go talk to your dad and tell him, you know, that you're mature enough to make your own decisions. And that's kind of where the Agnes wisdom kind of wraps up for this episode. Mm -hmm. So the next scene. <laughs> <laughs> this show just gets weirder. I don't even know where to begin with this. Blossom is asleep in her bedroom. And Bobby is crawling up to her window on the worst-looking ladder I have ever seen. But that's part of a joke, which I thought was really good. Yeah, the ladder is really shoddy-looking because he made it in shop class that day. So he was in school that day <laughs> with the forward thinking of, I'm going to wait till Blossom is asleep tonight. I'm going to build this ladder... Take it home with me so that I can climb up to her bedroom window when no one's around. And not pressure her into having sex, which is where I assumed this was headed. Right. This was where I expected the darkness to start seeping in, and we're going to learn our lesson. We're going to learn Stephen Dorff's true colors, where, much like Alicia Silverstone, he doesn't really care if she's going to throw herself off a bridge or not. He only wants one thing. Yeah. But no. No. I can't even wrap my head around this cell. So this is so con convoluted. So 
maybe he's respecting all the women he sleeps with. I don't know. But he has a history of sleeping with everyone he dates until now. I don't know how I'm supposed to feel about this character. He's sneaking up to her window as the absolute gentleman. He basically says he's going to talk to her dad. So she'll let him go to prom with him. And he's not interested in any sort of physical contact with Blossom past kissing. Yeah. Which I... Like, I... (sighs) What is happening? Who wrote this? Yeah, it really had me questioning the character altogether. Because you and I were on the same page of thinking that... Which is waiting for the other shoe to drop and thinking that that's where this is going to go. And it just keeps not happening but then i thought like maybe it was maybe he actually is the good guy and everybody just assumes that he's hooking up with all these girls and he's really not maybe he just is i also thought that i thought maybe that would be the revelation yeah is that but it's not it's all it's all his reputation and he's not as cool as people think he is yeah and he doesn't have this he doesn't have the numbers everybody assumes he does. Right. But the but writer no. the writers didn't do a good enough job of giving that backstory to be like, oh, this is how it actually was the whole time. Like So you just At assume this point, that it's gonna be Steven Dorf being a Steven Dorf type. Right. At this point, I'm really looking at the time left in the episode and thinking to myself. <laughs> This guy is actually legit. Oh my god. This guy that is two years older than Blossom, that has a history of sleeping with all the girls he dates, has completely given up on that to fall for trumpet playing Joey's little sister, two years younger than him. Dude, I am so glad that you said that you looked at the time left in the episode. Because that is exactly what I did at this point as well. And I was like, they have a lot of ground to cover if he's going to take her to prom and dump pig's blood on her like they do in Carrie. Yeah, exactly. Is this a two-parter? Are we going to see To Be Continued at the end? I don't know. I don't know what to do with this episode, Sal. Bobby said that he's going to talk to her dad about it. And then they kiss. Yeah. They kiss before he leaves. And this is supposed to be a big moment. But how is it when he sleeps with all his dates? You know what I mean? If it was really trying to, like, reveal him to be, like, the good guy all along. Like, it just, there wasn't enough backstory there to show that. Does this warrant an ooh from the live studio (laughs) audience if it's Blossom's first kiss with a womanizer? I can't wrap my head around Steven Dorff's character. The next scene... Anthony's there. Hey, yes. Anthony. Anthony is finally in this episode. And guess what he does? Like five seconds into being in this episode. <laughs> he references that he used to be a junkie. Blossom asks him if he's ever disappointed their dad. And he responds, yeah, being a drug addict for four years. <laughs> Which, again, I hated myself for laughing, but I wasn't laughing at the fact that he was a drug addict for four years. I'm laughing at the fact that this is this character. He shows up for 30 seconds, and all he brings to the table is that he's a former drug addict, and the laugh track goes off. Yeah. I just, what a weird character for this show. Obviously, they're just planting seeds, and he's going to have future episodes where this storyline is the feature storyline at the time, and they're going to explore this more. I get that. But it was like that in episode one, too. He just, he has one line, and it's about how he used to be a drug addict, and then the laugh track goes off. Very confusing. And also, he looked like a jet in this scene, like an outsider. Like, what what was his attire here? (laughs) He was practicing his finger snaps before yeah. Blossom came in. He was wearing like a cutoff jean vest and like the white t-shirt with the <laughs> sleeves rolled up. Like, did he have a pack of cigarettes under his arm? Like, <laughs> he was gonna. Bu- he was about to go try to stab Pony Boy Curtis before she got yeah. there. He looked like Snake from The Simpsons. Like, what was going on with this? <laughs> they really had to, because he dressed so. 
He was in like a almost like what was he wearing in episode one? It was all a preppy, yeah, wearing like a loose untucked suit, wasn't he? Yeah, pretty totally. much. Totally. The studio was like, no, no, that's not how drug addicts dress. They have they wear jean jackets. <laughs> Uh, then Joey comes in, oh, I couldn't sleep either. And then he comes clean about spilling the beans about how Bobby's a womanizer to dad. And that's what shook dad's soda so much, which caused the conversation with Blossom. And Can you forgive me? And she does. And that scene should have been a couple minutes and it was about 10 seconds. There's just like nothing to hang your hat onto in this episode at all. I would agree with you. It's, it's just a little bit over here and then suddenly you're over there and you know it's just nothing there's no nothing's linear in this episode so i'm finally this is it bobby shows up he's going to take her to prom here's going to be the explosion where there's a big reveal he's not a nice guy and the men in blossom's life save her from this humiliation or save her from the expectation of putting out at the end of prom there's going to be a big payoff of this vague Steven Dorff character known as Bobby. This is where it's all going to go down, right? Did you feel that? Yeah, absolutely. And he shows up, and he's respectful, and he wins over the dad. Not before the dad threatens to throw him through a wall. Oh, yeah, I wrote that. Because he's super respectful. And then, yeah, no, what does he say? Russo says, when I was your age, I was much older or something. There was like a line that was kind of funny, but was... A little of that joke needed some some fine tuning. Yeah, and then yeah, don't get smart with me, kid. I'll put you through the wall. And then did you notice about one eighth of the studio audience laughed? There's like three laughs. There's like, ah, ah, <laughs> is it uh, is this funny? Nobody knew if that was funny or not, but a few a few brave psychopaths laughed. Yeah, and then suddenly uh, Nick does a complete one eighty on this. Yeah, and tells Blossom to go to the prom with him after all. Even though, is he okay with them having sex? Or does he just trust Blossom she's not going to? Or is he just treating her like an adult and letting her make that decision herself? I think that's what I got from this, was that after the talk that he had with Bobby, he realized, you know, his intentions were maybe good. You know, Blossom's old enough to make her own decisions and that he should just trust her, which is why he wasn't happy about her, you know, going on, a date. Let's explore this though. Let's explore this. Why are Bobby's intentions good now? Like, what is Blossom bringing to the table? And I'm not ragging on the Blossom character or making any sort of comment on like her physical appearance. No, I'm but no, I'm with you there. Yeah, I don't think she's the popular girl of her grade. I think we've established that. That's why this whole episode was weird to me. It was like it just seemed like he was way too into Blossom for no reason at all. And it's not like he couldn't have been into Blossom. It's entirely possible that he was. I just feel like there wasn't enough backstory sure. to be like, oh, there's history between them. And like they even said in the beginning of the episode, like this was the first time this guy was coming over to their house. So it's not like he hung out with Joey all the time and like got to know Blossom through that. Like it just seemed odd. It seems like after episode one, they looked at the numbers and it was watched by a very large group of young women. And the idiot whoever makes decisions were like okay let's cater to them in almost a pandering way we're like oh here's an episode where the most popular boy in school wants the you know is suddenly super into the uh like reclusive introverted younger woman and he's completely willing to change his deviant ways just to kiss her yeah and be so gentlemanly and you know that's such a i'm assuming weird here's what i think young women would be into fantasy for a television show yeah i don't know man i just i don't know what to do with this storyline at all was that like throwing a fish to young women from some studio exec that has no idea how teenage girls thought back in 1991 like this is totally what they want to see oh yeah they're going to love this show. Look, it's the older bad boy falling for the younger introvert. Kind of like how Spider-Man, you have the nerd Peter Parker, but then the model redheaded Mary Jane falls in love with him. It's almost like throwing them a bone. Like, hey, if you're a nerd, mm, you never know. A redheaded model might fall for you, huh? Keep buying our comics. 
I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with this. Out. I hate this episode. I hate the writing in this episode. I like the characters. I'm enjoying this show, but this is just the most convoluted script I might have seen ever in television. I think you're right. I agree with you. 14-year-old Blossom comes down the stairs in her dress, and one pervert in the live studio audience catcalls her. <laughs> I imagine this guy standing up and being like, Yeah! Ow! Woo! And then looking around and no one else did that. And no one else? back down all Just me? No? No one else? No? <laughs> Nick is also in a tuxedo. Because he's getting ready yes. to go to this Hollywood Bowl. Which we would find out later ended before senior prom. Yeah. <laughs> or, ju or junior prom. Sounds pretty lame. And where's Six? Is she still on the walk waiting for Joey? Yeah. She's waiting at the park for it, him. It was like they shot this episode and realized it was two and a half hours. There's a lot of story gaps that were not filled in here at all. Bobby asks Nick why he's all dressed up. And Nick says, I'm coming with you two. Is that okay? And he says, sir... It would be an honor. To where Nick says, Relax, kid, you already got the part. Which is a great exchange. But now I'm looking at Bobby going, Why do girls like this guy? Like, this is not the kind of guy that girls fall for. I don't know. Just not, nothing makes sense in this episode. Nothing makes sense casting-wise. Alright, Curtis, so this brings us to the last scene. I've given up on the other shoe dropping at this point, and this is just legit. Yeah, so Nick runs in the front door in a rush, and Joey and Anthony are both sitting on the couch wearing tuxedos. So now Nick runs in in his tuxedo asking if Blossom's back from the prom yet. Nick goes on to ask Joey why he's home so early, and Joey explains that his date wanted to go to the prom to actually dance. He said she liked the punch and wanted to introduce him to her parents. He got hustled. So why did he care if Blossom went on a date with Bobby, if Bobby wasn't that guy. I don't know. Nothing makes sense in this episode. No. They can't finish this episode without a second reference to Anthony's drug use. Yep. So Nick asks Anthony why he's in a tux, and he says, well, everybody else was dressed up, and he still had the tux that he rented from his prom, which Nick goes on to ask him why he didn't return the tux, and Anthony says he couldn't remember where he rented it from. Because he's a drug addict. Yeah, and it seems like at this point, Nick seems really lax when it comes to Joey and Anthony. When Anthony was 16 going to his junior prom, was so off of his ass that he couldn't remember where he rented his tux from, and Nick didn't seem to care. That's a really good point. Where he cares about all of a sudden who Blossom's going to a dance with to dance. And he doesn't seem to care that Joey left prom because he realized he wasn't going to score. Yeah. All three are in tuxes, which you think is going to pay off in a joke, and it doesn't. No, not at all. So Blossom and Bobby arrive back, and they say goodbye. And it is just the perfect stupid ending to an episode that makes no sense. Yeah. They try to force some comedy by showing the three men's faces in the window. But it's not funny, because I am trying to wrap my head around this episode and what has transpired. So, we have one of the most popular male students in high school play sports all the girls love him he has slept with many women he falls for blossom who's two years younger than him who is not that type of girl but he just can't get over her to the point where he forgoes his usual dating behavior and he's treating her with the utmost respect going way over the top just to take her to prom not expecting sex and then at the very end, they say goodbye, and it's almost a shoulder shrug. And he's going to be there for another week, and there's no talk of getting together the next day or anything. It's like, this is it. Yeah. And you're trying to tell me Blossom doesn't fall to her knees, screaming and crying and thrashing, because this girl has won the high school lottery, and now it's all been taken away from her. If episode 3 and episode 4 aren't her laying on the couch crying for 22 minutes? I don't know what to tell you. Could you imagine? Could you imagine dating the most popular girl in school suddenly and then her leaving? Where, where, does, that, where does that leave you? She's going to be chasing the Bobby high, the Stephen <laughs> Dorff high, the rest of her life. And it's like, shoulder shrug. Well, that's it. All right. Maybe it'll end off like uh, the crazy video. <laughs> oh, Sal. Oh, no, no, no good? No, no. 
So last week you brought up producer Paul Jungerwit. Yeah. And I didn't notice that the first time. And I looked into it this time and your inflection. It's just a funny name. He sound he sounds like a Tarzan villain. Yes. I don't know if because Junger sounds like jungle. I I'm with you. So I decided to do a little bit of research on this guy. He has a really long career in television and movies. His TV career started in the 1960s. He was a producer's assistant on Farmer's Daughter. Ah. He went on to produce The Partridge Family. He also has TV show names like Benson, Golden Girls under his belt, Blossom, obviously, Empty Nest. But then I had to stop dead in my tracks. He, he had a lot more shows that I could have gotten into, but I had to stop at this one and research everything that I could about this. And, and here's, here's where it goes. He produced a 1995 series for CBS called The Office. No. Yes. What? Gets weirder than that. The Office on CBS in 1995 was a remake of a British series called Upstairs, Downstairs. How has nobody ever talked about this? How has this not come up? How did I have to watch Blossom and do a Blossom podcast to figure this out? This is a Mandela effect, bud. So here is a synopsis of the 1995 series of The Office. An office comedy version of the British series Upstairs, Downstairs, centering on the camaraderie of executives and their secretaries of a busy corporate office at a design packaging company. It ran on CBS in 1995. There were six episodes made. One of them went unaired. Paul Jungerwit was a producer on that show. How many walls could you possibly punch being part of 1995 Office? Right. And missing it. Right. How much drywall was destroyed? How How much alcohol is still consumed to this day by the people who worked on that show and have it not be a hit? And I have never, before this day, before I looked up Paul Jungerwit, did not know that. The parallels between that. Oh, yeah. And, like, it's just, how has this never, like, how did I not know this? How does nobody yeah. widely talk about this? That seems like that would be day one stuff if you're researching The Office. Right? right? And it's all because I looked oh. up Paul Jungerwit. You're welcome. So he, so he didn't fight Tarzan, is what you're saying. One final thought that I probably should have talked about in the middle of the episode, but I didn't. Let's hear it. I was not the most popular person in high school. I wasn't, like, beat up or anything, but I definitely was not hanging with the cool crowd. I was more towards middle of the social circle, which was fine. However, if one of the most popular girls two years my senior was suddenly interested in me, I would be too paranoid to even consider, too waiting for that other shoe to drop, too skeptical of these events to even consider going on a walk with her. I would 100% assume she is going to take me to prom and carry me, like drop pig's blood on me and humiliate me for being stupid enough to think that the most popular girl two years my senior would one have want to have anything to do with me and that was where i thought they really kind of threw the character of blossom down the stairs a little bit i felt she would have had questions which she clearly did not she went along i mean it worked out for her right but at the same time somebody who is a smart young woman would have definitely been skeptical i felt Is that bad writing, or are we just really paranoid? Both? No, it's bad writing. It's 100% bad writing. It was like they took episode two's script, tore it up, and asked some 50-year-old guy in a suit in some office on the sixth floor and said, what do you think a 14-year-old girl would be glued to the TV watching? And, oh, how about the most popular senior in school wants to take her to the junior prom? Write it. Run with it. I don't care if it's not connected in any way from what we saw last week and causes all the characters to act in ways they wouldn't normally act from the amazing pilot the week before. Make it happen. We need to bring those numbers up. Is literally what I felt watching this episode. This was a fun deep dive on the episode nonetheless. 
blew my mind, Sal. Absolutely. Felt like we learned a lot today. So next week, we are moving well along here. Season 1, Episode 3. It is titled, Dad's Girlfriend. I am off to watch Aerosmith Cryin' music video another six times before I call it a night. I think that's a good idea. I think we should all watch that. And for some strange reason, he's dressed like a lab. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs>